Hello class, this is Dr. Anderson and this is our last installment of Reproductive Physiology uh, and we'll be talking about pregnancy and lactation. These are our learning objectives. I'd like you to be able to describe the events of fertilization and uh, let me see if I can get my laser pointer here. Fertilization and some aspects of development. Mostly about fertilization but um, then the fertilized zygote becomes an, uh, an embryo and then becomes a fetus. There are important hormones for pregnancy, so you ought to be able to follow the levels of uh, HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin, estrogen, and progesterone over the course of pregnancy. Uh, labor and delivery is a positive feedback mechanism, so labor has three stages. That, that occurs in a positive feedback mechanism and I'd like you to be able to describe those three stages and why it is a positive feedback mechanism. And finally we're going to talk about the role of oxytocin in an uh, important aspect of breastfeeding which is milk letdown. So in this picture you see a secondary oocyte surrounded by granulosa cells, that's the corona radiata, and there are several sperm. The cap of the sperm have some enzymes that are that uh, uh, that cap is called the acrosome and those enzymes are released in what's called the acrosomal reaction and um, the sperm can then burrow in between the cells and you see here one cell, ha one sperm has made it and when that happens there are granules underneath the membrane that are released and that's called the cortical reaction and this zona pellucida becomes impenetrable and no other sperm can come in. Um, the fertilization by the sperm is then the trigger for the second meiotic division so that this cell can become a mature ovum and then the two nuclei fuse and then you have what's called a zygote. So the zygote is contained within this zona pellucida so not only does the zona pellucida prevent other sperm from fertilizing the cell, but it also prevents the embryo from implanting too early because we are still in the fallopian tube. So as the cell makes its way through the fallopian tube, it's going to divide. And so we have one big cell that's now two smaller cells and four smaller cells and eight smaller cells. Now this group of cells is called a morula. Morula means mulberry and that's about when it's entering the uterus and then we have more cells. The cells start to divide into two varieties. There's the cells on the outside of this ball of cells. That's called the trophoblast and that's going to contribute to the fetal membranes and to the um, embryo's contribution to the placenta. These are the cells that produce human chorionic gonadotropin, which is the basis of the pregnancy test. And then we have some cells inside called the inner cell mass. That's what's going to become the embryo. And notice this structure has to hatch out of the zona pellucida so it can, it can attach to the mother's tissues. So here we are in, in the uh, ovary, there's the uh, dominant follicle, it bursts and releases the secondary oocyte, the remainder of the follicle stays in the ovary and becomes the corpus luteum. The secondary oocyte then travels along the um, uh, fallopian tube and about a third of the way down is when it would meet any sperm and this is where fertilization occurs. So fertilization is the stimulus for the second meiotic division. Now you have a mature ovum. The nuclei of the mature ovum and the sperm join. Now you have a zygote and the zygote divides mitotically as it travels along the fallopian tube. The morula enters the uterus. The cells continue to uh, divide the blastocyst has to hatch out of the zona pellucida so that the blastocyst can attach to the mother's membranes and this is a process called um, implantation. When the um, embryo implants uh, there can be a little bit of bleeding and so uh, 
about the time women are expecting their menstrual period uh, would be about the time that uh, implanting is, is occurring. And um, she might think she's having a light period when actually what she's having is implantation bleeding. Um, and so this can, um, some women can be a little bit confused about exactly when they were pregnant um, uh, because of this little bit of implantation bleeding. So here's the um, uh, trophoblast. Notice that the inner cell mass is what lines up against the mother's tissues. And the cells of the trophoblast begin to divide and they sort of make their way out into the mother's tissues. So now we have um, there's a cytotrophoblastin and syncytiotrophoblast. Those terms aren't used here, but they, they sort of differentiate. And these cells fuse and they produce enzymes that digest the mother's tissue because this organism is trying to find the mother's blood vessels. And so that union can be formed and a placenta can be formed. Now notice with impl implantation, then the mother's tissue actually covers up the whole embryo. So if you remember from general biology, when you looked at development of the, of the um, embryo, so here all the cells are the same. The cells start dividing into um, um, endoderm and ectoderm. Um, there's a little bit of an amniotic cavity that starts forming. And then you have um, um, endoderm and ectoderm, and in between forms a layer called mesoderm. That's a process called gastrulation. Um, and you may, have rem you may remember from general biology when you talked about this sort of thing, when you talked about gastrulation, you looked at it in the frog oocyte. And you may have wondered, why didn't we look at this in mammals? Well, in mammals, this process all happens under wraps in the uterus. Uh, so it's more easily visible in the frog o oocyte, which is why it's demonstrated there. But you have some cells that div dive in. So then you've got endoderm, ectoderm, and mesoderm, and those are the three germ layers that produce all the tissues that are going to form um, this embryo, which is then going to be a fetus and then eventually be a baby. Um, here is, you see some uh, material that's called the uh, yolk sac. Um, that helps form some of the GI tract. That helps form some of the blood vessels. Here's the amniotic cavity developing a little bit more. Here are the, now you see all of these little projections are out in all di little directions. Each of these little points, these are called chorionic villi. And uh, there's a test that can be done early in, uh, in uh, pregnancy called chorionic villi sampling. Um, if you want to sample some cells and see what the health of the, of the embryo is. Um, however, um, it's being found that uh, fetal and embryonic DNA end up in the mother's blood. And so as the, that testing gets perfected, um, the uh, need for uh, chorionic sampling, uh, villi sampling, is a pretty invasive test. And you really only want to do that when it's absolutely necessary. OK, I'm going on a little bit of a tangent. But here you see this embryo developing under cover uh, in the wall of the mother's um, uterus, in the wall of the uh, endometrium. So uh, here's gastrulation. Here is the, um, uh, what's going to be the ectoderm, what's on the outside of the body, the mesoderm, which is, forms a lot of the muscles and the internal organs, the endoderm, which is the lining of the lungs, the lining of the GI tract, the lining of the urinary tract, um, and all those wonderful things. And these cells out here are um, the, the cells that are going to be close to the mother's endometrium. These cells are going to end up forming, it, forming the placenta. And then out here, we're going to end up having, uh, this is the chorion. And eventually, this amnion is going to grow right into the chorion, and those make up the, the um, uh, fetal membranes, the amnion and the chorion. 
So here, um, this might still be an embryo, or it might be on the cusp of being a fetus. So I would say we don't have anything in the labeling to tell us, but I would say this is 8 to 10 weeks. And so you see a number of things going on. This is looking kind of like a human. We see some arms and legs. We see the formation of the umbilical cord. So this is the yolk sac. So if you if we um, uh, remember from the from the picture before, there was this uh, yellow structure, the yolk sac. It a piece of it pinches off and forms the GI tract, and then the a lot of it folds into the uh, uh, um, umbilical cord. So here's the chorion, here's the amnion. The amnion is going to eventually grow and the amnion and chorion are going to just be one, looks like one membrane. Um, here's the, the mother's tissues, uh, what's called the decidua capillaris that covers the whole thing. Um, so when moms are pregnant, the um, endometrium isn't called the endometrium anymore, it's called the um, the um, decidua. So a lot of terms um, that you don't really need to worry about just so we know where we are. Here's the smooth muscle, so that's the uh, the myometrium. And here you see the chorionic villi that came from the embryo and then the tissue of the mother. And this is where exchange is going to occur. So if we look in this inset you see these chorion are filled with blood vessels that belong to the fetus and then they're surrounded by blood that comes from the mother and so exchange occurs across this membrane so oxygen which is lipid soluble can diffuse from the mother into the fetal capillaries um, CO2 produced by the um, embryo and then the fetus can diffuse from the, the chorionic villi across and into the mother's tissues. Um, glucose is able to be taken up across a glute transporter. Um, there are some antibodies that the mother can make that can be transported into uh, into the fetal um, uh, chorionic villi and into that capillary system. Uh, something like alcohol which is lipid soluble, has ready access to the fetus, which is why um, pregnant moms should not be drinking alcohol. Um, uh, there really isn't a safe uh, level. Um, and um, uh, because that, that material has uh, ready access to the, to the developing fetus. Um, so if mothers need to be on medication, um, they're uh, physicians or their nurse practitioners want to think about medications that don't cross the placenta that will help the mother with her medical needs but not cross the placenta and go over to the fetus. Uh, another thing I want you to notice here is notice that the umbilical arteries are blue and the umbilical vein is red. Now why is that? Well, we name arteries and veins based on where they're going arteries are going from the fetus to the placenta but they're carrying venous blood and the vein is going from the placenta back to the fetus but it's carrying oxygenated blood so it's kind of similar to the pulmonary system so if this fetus is you know I'm going to just go out on a limb here and say yes this is a fetus because by nine weeks you would call um, the embryo becomes a fetus. All the organ systems have been laid down. It's got a beating heart. It's got kidneys. It's got a you know a brain. Uh, not everything is completely formed yet, um, but all the organ systems have been laid down. They have lungs, but the lungs are very immature. And if you remember from pulmonary lab, the lungs are actually the last tissue system to um, mature, and so premature babies can have some lung problems. Um, but once the, the, the um, organism becomes a fetus, its main job is to grow uh, because the, basically all the brains, uh, the organ systems have been laid down.
Okay, so I don't know if I had some duplicated slides there or what happened, but I want to talk a little bit about um, um, the hormones that are produced during pregnancy. So notice, very early in the pregnancy, there's a big spike of secretion of a peptide hormone. This hormone comes from the uh, trophoblast or the chorion. So some textbooks will say it comes from the placenta, and that's not incorrect, but the placenta isn't really formed when this, this hormone starts being secreted. It comes from those trophoblast cells that, that, uh, that surround the uh, inner cell mass. Now, human chorionic gonadotropin is a hormone that's a lot like LH. And what it does is tells the corpus luteum to not die. It says, we have an embryo here, and we need you to keep secreting estrogen and progesterone so that endometrium doesn't shed. Once the placenta forms, then the placenta can take over hormone secretion, and then we don't need uh, corpus luteum anymore. Human chorionic gonadotropin is the basis of the pregnancy test. So you go to the drugstore, and you get a little stick, and you put some urine on there, and it looks for HCG in the urine, and, uh, and uh, is a way to tell if a woman's pregnant or not. Um, HCG is also implicated for morning sickness. Um, early in pregnancy and the nausea some women feel early in pregnancy. Now notice, so, uh, you know, by the time we get to the end of the, of the um, first trimester, and notice we're starting at the uh, last menstrual period, because we don't actually know when, exactly when fertilization happened. But um, this, uh, spike of human, human chorionic gonadotropin decreases, but notice estrogen levels and progesterone levels increase throughout pregnancy. Um, notice that early in pregnancy, um, estrogen and progesterone levels are kind of close together, uh, but towards the end of pregnancy, estrogen is much, much higher than progesterone. So early in pregnancy, progesterone is the predominant hormone. It's very important for keeping the uterus relaxed so that pregnancy can keep going. At the end of pregnancy, estrogen levels get much higher than progesterone, and that is what's important for turning the uterine smooth muscle into single unit smooth muscle that's going to be a contracting smooth muscle. Now notice with delivery of the baby and the placenta, the hormone levels then just plummet. And that tells you that a lot of these hormones have been coming from the placenta. So what are these hormones doing in pregnancy? So progesterone, the predominant hormone in the first parts of pregnancy, the, at least the first um, uh, seven or eight months, it helps keep the myometrium relaxed. And so there's a critical thinking exercise that I'd like you to work on that asks you to think about what kinds of proteins should be upregulated and activated by progesterone. I mean, progesterone's a steroid. It diffuses into cells, finds a, an intracellular receptor. Progesterone and the receptor then interact with the DNA to increase gene transcription. What kind of proteins do we want to make? What kind of proteins do we not want to make? And I'd like you to think about that in that critical thinking exercise. Now, estradiol, it, it increases throughout pregnancy, but it's much more important during that last month. And what it does is it gets the myometrium ready for labor, because you've got to contract and squeeze this baby out. So moms will first feel something called Braxton Hick contractions. They're just tightening contractions. And uh, they don't really hurt, but you kind of feel the uterus tightening. And the, the, that means that um, the smooth muscle is becoming single unit. Well, how would you convert multi-unit myometrium to single unit myometrium? You would upregulate gap junctions, and estrogen is very important for that. So I'm such a nerd that when I was in my... Uh, uh, 
the end of my pregnancies, I've had two children, and uh, towards the end, when I could feel those Braxton Hicks, I would think, oh, I'm getting j gap junctions, that's really great. And th so now those cells can depolarize together and contract together, so you have a coordinated contraction to push a baby out with. So labor is very, very complicated. There's a lot of stuff going on. The increase in estrogen levels help with the upregulation of oxytocin receptors. The uterus becomes more sensitive to oxytocin. And what happens is the uterus starts to contract. And then when the uterus starts to contract, then action potentials go back to the brain and the brain starts producing this hormone um, uh, oxytocin. Remember, oxytocin is synthesized in the hypothalamus and released from the posterior pituitary. And then oxytocin causes more contractions. So labor happens in three stages. Initially, the contractions are to pull open the cervix. The cervix has to thin and dilate and has to dilate to 10 centimeters because the cervix has to be at least 10 centimeters to get a baby head out of that. So moms start feeling like they want to push, but they cannot push until, and that's where all the breathing comes in, uh, but they should not be pushing until the cervix is fully dilated. When the cervix is fully dilated, then mom starts bearing down and pushing, trying to push the baby out through this opening. And um, you want the baby he baby's head to be down and the face to be down so that um, you can get the head out under the, the pubic bone and then the rest of the body can come out. Um, and it's helpful to have a nurse or a midwife or a physician helping guide the, the baby out, though there are certainly... Um, people that have delivered babies at home without, uh, without the help of, of a so-called professional. So when the baby is born, that's the second stage of labor, but we're not done yet because the placenta has to be uh, delivered. So the, the um, midwife or the labor and delivery nurses will push on the belly, will push on the abdomen and encourage those contractions to keep going so that the entire placenta can be delivered. This is really important because if pieces of the placenta are left behind, then the then the lining of the uterus doesn't clot properly and, um, and a woman would be in danger of hemorrhage. Um, and uh, and those contractions help deliver the placenta, start squeezing those blood vessels down so you can clot and stop the bleeding and that sort of thing. So labor is a positive feedback mechanism. So initially, um, the uterus starts to contract and the baby's head pushes on the cervix. There are receptors in the cervix that uh, are connected to neurons that then send impulses back to the control center. The control center is the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus then starts generating action potentials. Action potentials go down to the axon terminus. Oxytocin is released from the posterior pituitary. Oxytocin then goes into the blood to oxytocin receptors in the uterine smooth muscle. Then you get more contractions. So then the baby pushes on the cervix even more, which causes more action potentials to go to the control center, which causes the release of more oxytocin, which causes stronger contractions. And this continues to build and build and build until we deliver the baby and then uh, delivering the um, um, placenta. And when the placenta is delivered, there's no more stretching of the cervix, and, um, and, and the, then that positive feedback mechanism is over. All right. Now, once we birth the baby, then we got to feed the baby. And the breast is an example of an exocrine gland, and it's a very complicated exocrine gland. It needs a lot of hormones to help it do its, help it do its job. First of all, estrogen grows the breast. Remember, growth of the breast is the first sign of puberty in girls. Then, progesterone works upon the, uh, upon the breasts to develop this duct system and, and truly turn the breast into a gland. Uh, then, we have a hormone called prolactin. Now, remember, 
the hypothalamus produces a hormone called dopamine. Dopamine then goes through the portal system and inhibits the production of prolactin. Because if you're not feeding a baby, you don't need to be making a lot of prolactin. So it's typically inhibited. So the process of birth and delivering the baby and feeding the baby at the breast stimulates the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus then inhibits dopamine production. And when dopamine is removed, then prolactin can be released. So prolactin, pro-milk. Prolactin makes the milk. Now, how do we release the milk? Well, it happens because of a hormone called oxytocin. Wasn't that the same hormone that was important for uterine contractions? It was indeed. Oxytocin is also helpful for um, allowing the, um, uh, the milk to be let down. So, so, the, um, so we have a, a gland here that's full of milk, and there are some contractile cells around the milk glands and oxytocin helps those little contractile cells to squeeze so that the, the milk is released into the glands and then the baby can drink the milk from the nipple. So essentially, the baby suckling at the breast stimulates mechanoreceptors, which then go to the hypothalamus, tell the hypothalamus to release oxytocin, oxytocin contracts the glands, and then the milk is released. So uh, that's shown in this feedback mechanism here. So the baby uh, sucks on the nipple. That causes uh, these mechanoreceptors to be stimulated. Action potentials go back to the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus sends action potentials to the posterior pituitary. Oxytocin in the blood causes those contractile cells around the glands to contract, and then milk is ejected. So as long as mom keeps breastfeeding and the baby keeps sucking at the breast, then the body is encouraged to make the milk and release the milk. Uh, if mom stops breastfeeding, then, um, then the, the, the brain isn't getting the signal to to release prolactin and release oxytocin and the breasts definitely you know eventually the glands um, get smaller and stop making all the milk and so forth other thing is uh, there are other things that can affect the control center it's not shown here but um, sometimes a mom can hear her baby cry or even hear someone else's baby cry. Whoops, that's supposed to say crying, and that you can't read it at all, can you? Um, so, the, so the baby is crying. Mom, I'm hungry. And mom hears that sound, and that directly in, impacts the hypothalamus, and she'll start to release milk. Um, and I've got a nice uh, little message from my video game on my computer. Isn't that nice? Okay, so uh, so uh, a baby crying uh, can also stimulate this reflex. Okay, so this is a this is a um, uh, flow chart from another textbook, but I think it's really helpful. So the baby suckling at the nipple, and there are um, and there are mechanoreceptors. So then. Neural inputs, action potentials, go back to the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus is going to tell the posterior pituitary to release oxytocin. And the hypothalamus is going to inhibit dopamine. They inhibit dopamine, then there will be prolactin secretion. So prolactin helps make the milk. Oxytocin helps release the milk. Now, the first milk moms make is called um, colostrum. It's a very, very nutritious substance, um, and so it may be three or four days before mom makes the true mother's milk. So there's um, um, there's some some challenges that can uh, can happen with uh, trying to breastfeed. So imagine a mother's had just a, a wonderful um, uh, 
vaginal birth. She's there with her midwife. She delivers the baby, and they suction out the baby's mouth, give the baby to mom, and mom puts the baby to her breast immediately. Um, and then the mother um, starts to feel the letdown from her breast. Now that very first milk is going to, going to be colostrum, very nutritious though, and, and so she may feel the colostrum leaving her breasts, but she also might feel uterine contractions. Holy mackerel. So the birth is all done. She's feeding the baby and she feels uterine contractions. So I want you to think about this. Oxytocin is a hormone. How could oxytocin cause both milk letdown and uterine contraction? This is a question in your CT book and I'd like you to think about that. Alrighty, so um, we are uh, finishing. Uh, this is our last presentation on uh, um, um, reproduction. And so I'd like you to bring your book and your CT book to lab. We are going to be working on CTs. There'll be a couple of them that you'll turn in for credit. Um, but it also will be a wonderful opportunity for you to work with the TAs on all of the CTs. I would like to really, really emphasize that doing those CTs will be a wonderful way to um, prepare for your upcoming exam. Um, post your questions on the website if you have any. Um, keep up the good work. Keep up all that good studying. And I'll see you in class next time.